Karsten Brash on Father's Day. Well, that's an interesting name, and how do we? why are we starting this way and everything? My name is Al Persson. You can contact me at pastor at mascot.church or in the comments below. If you like, share, and subscribe to this video or videos on this channel, YouTube might recommend them to somebody else. Who knows? You never know your luck in the big city, we always say at home. And uh, so let's on to our topic. In this part of the world, it's Father's Day on um, this coming Sunday, the 3rd of September, uh, first Sunday of September. And so um, we, of course, kind of have conversations around that in our church. The purpose of this video channel is really to supplement what's going on. If, um, you know, in our church, for those who can't attend or whatever, can we give a, a little bit of a picture of what we're talking about? Well, Karsten Brasch was a German tennis player. And in 1998, he overheard Serena and the Williams sisters say that they could beat any man um, outside of the top 200 in uh, tennis. And so, and he overheard the conversation. And Karsten Brasch was pretty much um, near the end of his career, not in very good shape. He, he didn't look the athlete type. Uh, he would, um, uh, was well known for smoking between sets and even drinking a little bit. And uh, so uh, it was like, okay, are you the picture of male health and strength? Not particularly, but uh, whatever. So we challenged the Williams sisters at Melbourne Park to uh, a tennis match, and he defeated both of them. And you can find the story everywhere. And uh, later on, it was, I think, Serena Williams who denied the event ever took place, but it's well and truly recorded. And uh, it, it was just really fascinating. And then they said, well, we could beat anybody out of the, I think they said, um, um, out of the top 300, something like that. And Brash said, well, having just lost this match, or I'm going to lose the one that's coming up. Another one said, I'll, I'll be at 350. And um, any time, <laughs> I'll rematch you. Uh, but they never did that. And uh, it, it was an interesting event. It's worth having a read about. What it does is it's one of those many stories that highlights the physical differences between um, men and women. And, uh, uh, and I think these things are things that we somehow have forgotten about. We somehow in our society kind of thought that everything a man can do, a woman can do, and everything a woman can do, a man can do. And it's, um, it, it's well, it's just proving to bring us into some difficulty, I think. There's, uh, there's a whole conversation around this that I think needs to be had, and, um, and I think it's worth doing. Just recently, we had an incident, an incident in our building where a gentleman collapsed and fell. He's a big man, and um, a couple of us uh, men were able to get him up into his unit, and we called the, uh, an ambulance. Uh, in fact, the ambulance um, advised us to keep him there and everything. We did everything that they said. The ambulance arrived, two ladies, strong ladies, um, very capable, looked after him, and they had they put him in a particular chair, uh, but they were not able to get him down the stairs. Now, we could have done it. The three men in the building, we could easily, even though he was a big guy, we could easily have done it between ourselves, uh, but we weren't qualified to do that. So they had to call the fire brigade. And this is interesting. So they had the two ladies, uh, not physically strong enough to take this person down, and they had to call the fire brigade to do the lifting, which was three men in a fire truck. It was just really just fascinating. And uh, the lady said, oh, this happens frequently. And it's like, yeah, well, that's really interesting. We, we often put women in a place where, where physically they may not be as strong as men and are, uh, to, to do this work, and then we demand those things of them. And, and it's like, ah, oh. think about whether, think about this scenario. You're in a burning building and you're crippled and uh, you, you can't move, or maybe you're very, very ill, and you can't move, and the building's on fire, you need to get out. And so uh, it, the, your door is kicked down, and in walks a, um, a firefighter who is um, a female firefighter who is strong and capable, uh, but she's about your body weight. She does not have the ability to put you on her shoulders and carry you down those stairs, and you're going to have to walk down with her. It's like, oh, this is a real interesting challenge. Who would you rather have kicked the door open? Well, personally, I'd rather have that, um, uh, that two meter tall, 120 kilo guy who lifts weight, uh, lifts weights, um, throw me over my shoulder, him, um, over his shoulders and get me out of the building. And, you know, that's, that's not unreasonable, is it, when you think about it? It's kind of a, a, an odd place that we're at here, um, where uh, it, it seems that, that our, the coarseness of our society has, uh, has placed a lot of demands on both men and women that, that are not really particularly traditional. Now, this goes back a long way. In the modern era, there's a conversation in 1975 between Simone de Beauvoir and um, Betty Friedan. Now, let me just see if I can get this quote up here. And um, yeah, here we go. And so um, Betty Friedan in 1975 
uh, talked about whether uh, women should be given the choice to go to work or not, and uh, which is qu completely reasonable. You choose to go to work, you choose to go home, but it's or stay home or whatever. Now listen to Simone de Beauvoir's, I probably haven't pronounced her name just perfectly right, but listen to her response here. She said, no, we don't believe that any woman should have this choice. Oh, isn't that interesting? No woman should be authorized to stay home to raise her children, to stay at home to raise her children. Society should be totally different. Women should not have the choice, precisely because if there is such a choice, too many women will make that one. It is a way of forcing women in a certain direction. Okay, and then she said, in my opinion, as long as the family and the myth of the family and the myth of maternity and the, and the maternal instinct are not destroyed, women will still be oppressed. So that's the kind of thing you, you see today. You say, yeah, so what, are, what, what is being destroyed? The family, the myth of the family, the, the myth of maternity, um, the maternal instinct. Uh, women will still be oppressed. It's just really, really fascinating, isn't it? It's, it's, it, it, it's, um, it's odd to see what's happening. Now, by the way, we need to understand this is only really happening in the West. It's not happening in other parts of the world. It's not happening in the East. It's not happening in Russia. It's not happening in China and in large parts of Africa, in, in large parts of Asia at all. This is a Western thing that we're seeing here. And so that's also really curious. In fact, we, we had... Um, uh, we, we, tend to, we tend to be on a kind of a journey of self-destruction at the moment, which is interesting. Uh, my wife and I had the privilege of having um, uh, some Chinese students stay with us several years ago, and, and uh, it, was a, it was a real joy to do that. And I, I had a conversation with one of the young men, and I said, so, um, uh, and he was very smart, bright. All of them were bright, bright kids, right? And I said, well, uh, and by the way, they're, they're speaking, their native language is Mandarin, and they're speaking English well enough to get along here. I said, so wh why do you come to, to this country to be educated? Why don't you stay in your own universities? And uh, the one said, oh, no, we're not smart enough to stay in our own universities. I said, what do you mean? He said, no, the best students, the best ones are educated in the best universities in China, and they get looked after. The rest of us, if we, we get into trade school or something, or maybe we can get into a university somewhere else, implying the standards are much higher in China, and the best get educated there. Isn't that interesting? They look after their best, they build their best up, and so on. And this is not only happening in China, it's happening in other parts of the world also, but, but not in the West. It seems in the West we're just in this, in this declining, <laughs> we're just on this decline, which is really interesting. How long will it happen? I don't know. Look at my past um, videos on the, um, on the behavioral sink and getting kind of an idea as to where we are and what's going on. Well, it's Father's Day. And I just need to, uh, we need to get onto the scriptures here and make a couple of comments. One is that um, the standard for fathers and men in scripture is very high. By the way, the standard for everybody is high. And uh, it's something we aspire to. It's not, um, it's, so it's not set as a low standard that, you know, we fall over the line and we're there. It's very, very high. And I'm going to just take you to a couple of passages. First, uh, Paul writing to the Corinthians. And uh, then we'll flick to our main text today. We'll have a look at this high standard and see what you think. I'm going to pop this up on the screen here. Let's just move. I just changed my mouse that little bit here. And I want to go to this one first. And I just want to check something here. Is my machine still running? Man, I'm glad it is. So Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 in the English Standard Version, I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. So you see this children thing? For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then be imitators of me. So this is a very strong statement that Paul is making here. And he makes this, uh, th this statement uh, as an apostle, as a shaliach you know, of, of, of the Most High. He is able to do it. I can't make that claim as just a man who might have led someone to Christ. Paul could. The apostles could. They were in a very special place. But you see this father-children relationship. And it is true, at this point here, that there are not many fathers. There really aren't many spiritual leaders and men who you'd look to and say, this one is a father, this one is whatever. Now, ladies, you're not cut out here. Um, just understand the, the uh, culture, the time at which this was written. There aren't many mature Christians around that you can point someone to and say, 
This one is an example of how we should be living and so on. It seems that uh, the modern church has really favored the young who have really not learned very much in their life and set them up as standards or celebrities or whatever. And that's just not been necessarily a good thing. What's really a good thing that really works is to find mature, stable people who have gone through the journey. They've gone through life. They have seen um, uh, victories. They've seen suffering. They've seen it. They have built marriages. They've built homes and families. There's a lot of wisdom there. Learn to tap that. And probably my audience is a little bit older, so maybe you're just nodding and agreeing. Uh, but anyone younger, hey, take some advice from an old guy. <laughs> All right. Now let's look at this passage in um, the epistle of John here. And uh, we're going to see uh, in 1 John, we're going to see a standard thing that is really quite high. And uh, wow. So this is 1 John chapter 2. I'll flick the screen onto this here. And um, John is writing. He said, I, and by the way, this is a really complicated passage. It looks simple, but just um, let me read it to you. I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for my name, for his name's sake. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you've known him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you've overcome the evil one. I write. Now, notice he, why this is complicated is he changes his language from I am writing to I write. This makes this passage much more complicated <laughs> than it appears. Now he says, I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. So just having a look here, what does it say to fathers? First of all, it says, I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. Down below it says, I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. So it's, it's what John is doing and then what he is going to do or whatever. So this is difficult. And the commentators have a hard problem with this. The scholars have a difficult, a difficult journey trying to figure out what's actually going on here. We can, however, pull the eyes out of it without a real problem. Fathers, you know, he, John's statement is, I write, I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. Well, there you go. Now, I think that John is referring to fathers in the faith. I don't think that he's referring necessarily to biological fathers. I think he's referring to leaders and so on. And uh, I'm not sure that it's the same kind of language Paul is using a little later on. They're two different writers. Remember, it's two different contexts and so on. Now, if you are in my position in, the, in understanding the writings of these things, the, that is 1st John, 2nd John, 3rd John, and the book of Revelation, as well as others. I believe these things were written well before the fall of Jerusalem. Most of your Bibles will say, oh, well, John was 95 or 100 or whatever when he wrote this, etc. from Patmos, but I don't believe that's correct. I'm with the school that says that these are, uh, these books were written before the fall of Jerusalem, and there's a lot of strength to my, to the argument I have, and I believe that given in a few years' time, that'll be held by everybody. And, and so now let's get back to that. If that's the case, if my position is correct, uh, John is in his 60s at the time, but some of the men to whom he, and, I shouldn't say but, and some of the men to whom he is writing, because he's in a very Jewish context, possibly even knew the Lord Jesus Christ in his physical ministry. Possibly even did, John did. And so uh, it's possible that some of his audience did as well. This is really interesting. Let's just put this in context here. Now, let's just flip the time. Let's back a little bit here. John is, is saying, uh, I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. Notice how John opens John chapter 1 and 1 John. He talks about him who is and was and who is from the beginning. So I, I've got this sense in my, in my head that John is writing to this. He's writing to a, a group of men, who some of whom actually knew Jesus and others uh, know I mean, still know Jesus, he's risen from the dead, but knew him in his physical ministry, and probably others who maybe secondhand knew of him in his physical ministry. So that's interesting. But what's the obligation to us today as fathers? What's the obligation to us today as mature believers? We need to know him who is from the beginning. Very, very interesting. And look at the others in this, in this passage here. There are children who know that their sins are forgiven. I guess you could look at this in terms of spiritual growth. The first thing a believer knows, maybe, maybe they're 85 or 90 when they come to Christ. They don't know very much else, but they know that their sins are forgiven. 
It's a wonderful thing when you pray with somebody and, he come, and that person comes to Christ and they know that they're forgiven. This is the first thing that we know when we come into Christ. Now, it's wonderful to know it from the time when you're very, very young and then to be able to grow and to mature. He talks about young men and, uh, and he says this is where your strength is. The Bible in other places says that the glory of a young man is his strength. And, um, and, and you see this now in this text. Think about fathers, men, and children here. Just, just kind of come to the, a temporal interpretation of this passage. You mature men teach the younger ones to control your appetites, overcome the evil one, stand strong, stay focused. And the children, of course, they just they know very, very little, but they're going to grow into be, being younger and more mature people later on. So I think that's really fascinating. The obligation that, that we have as people who've been around for a while, and particularly fathers, particularly fathers, is to know him who is from the beginning. And look what happens. We are able then to influence those around us to help us. Let's see what it says about young men here. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. And he says down below, I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you've overcome the evil one. The obligations uh, on fathers is high, but look at the obligations on young men. You're strong. The word of God is in you. You've overcome the evil one. Now, it is assumed that the father is one who did that earlier in his life. The word of God was in him and he was strong and he overcame the evil one. You need to be strong to overcome the evil one, to overcome your appetites, to overcome the wickedness in the world. You need strength to do that. This is not something that happens automatically um, when you're lying around, you know, on the internet. No, you need to be strong daily to do that. So these are some interesting observations as we are here in Father's Day in the part of the world in which I live. What are we talking about here today? Well, first of all, the obligations on us are quite high. Scripture does not lightly um, or, or, or doesn't have a low standard and is unashamed about having a high standard for, uh, for believers. Fathers, you need to know the one who what is from the beginning. The, um, the prerequisite to that, what was part of you knowing that one is that the word of God is in you, that you overcome the evil one. What does that really mean? Well, you're in charge of your appetites. You know what I'm talking about. And of course, children, the only real revelation children have, those who come to Christ, the first thing is that they are forgiven. Isn't it a wonderful thing to watch somebody, to be with somebody when they pray, they ask God to forgive them of their sins, and God immediately gives them a kind of assurance that you can't, you can't purchase with money. It's this deep sense of, I'm right with God. The price has been paid. God is not angry at me. It's, wow, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And, uh, of course, that's, that's this whole message, and that's probably the, the, uh, the time as a Christian, maybe you remember the most, the time when you first met the Lord, when you felt that burden lifted off your lives. Well, my name, ladies and gentlemen, um, it still is Al Persson. You can contact me at pastor at mascot.church or in the comments below. Come back next week where we're going to talk, where, when we're going to talk about imprecation one more time.